Welcome to the Staying Alive and Rich podcast. I'm your host, Maria Gronowski. I can't wait to share this podcast with you guys today because I have the wonderful Dr. Paul Konsiencic talking about sleep solutions. Dr. Paul is an esteemed oral and maxillofacial surgeon, and he has dedicated his career in transforming the lives of lots of people around the world and in Australia through his innovative surgical solutions. He's written a book about it. His work is transformative. But we discuss how sleep is important to us um, and not only in our day to day of running events, but how not getting enough sleep or having things obstruct your sleep can actually affect your overall health. And it's a fascinating conversation that really has a domino effect. And we discuss how to remove that first domino with Dr. Paul during this episode. I'm super excited. I hope you guys are too, because there's some great insights in this conversation that I'm sure will help you or someone you love. Let's jump into, obviously there's been an increase of people with sleeping disorders, sleep apnea and and what have you. And with your background, you've seen a lot and you, you have actually helped a lot of people globally because you pioneered a new type of surgery that um, helps people not only breathe better, but perhaps um, snore and get a better night's sleep. Um, can you explain to me um, or explain to my audience and I um, this new and pioneering surgery that, you know, the results are incredible and how it well, helps yeah. people with um, sleep difficulty, especially women. The experience with women that I have is obviously 50% of my life. Okay. And um, the majority of people that I work with and deal with uh, are women. Um, but I, I profess to no expertise in that, only just respect. And... Um, uh, but I, I deal with women in, in the majority of as, as two people, um, as patients and as mothers mm-hmm. of patients. And uh, uh, w- when I was um, early on in, in my career, uh, the majority of, of my referrals was for removing teeth after having had orthodontics. And the teeth that I removed were wisdom teeth. Mm-hmm. And I'd always see these children uh, at around about 17 or 18 years of age uh, having gone through orthodontics, and I'm not aware of the process as such. Uh, it's, it's a bit secretive. Um, but a, a particular orthodontist sent me a child um, before uh, he had initiated uh, his orthodontics. Um, and, um, and the same orthodontic, thousands of wisdom teeth operations in odd-looking children uh, mm. at 17, 18 years of age. And, um, um, but, but this was the first time that I'd gotten a 12-year-old. 12. And, um, That's quite with, young for wisdom teeth. Well, not for wisdom teeth. No. no? He, had, he just had an enormous overbite. Mm. And he said, Paul, can you do that horrible jaw surgery operation that all the other maxillofacial surgeons uh, do rarely um, so, um, so I can put braces on him? Because um, he, his his lower jaw is just so small um, that um, his entire lower dentition fits inside his palate. Oh wow! <laughs> did, n- n- no teeth touched each other. Oh wow! And um, and so I sat with um, poor thing, poor little thing. And, and and she she was very upset and said, "Well, you know, why can't the orthodontist fix this?" And I said, "Well, you know, apparently they can't. Um, I I don't know much about orthodontics." Um, apart from the fact they send me wisdom teeth, um, but you know, I'm more than happy to fix your child's jaw so you can get braces. Um, and uh, so uh, she said, how are you going to do that? And just like all surgeons, proper surgeons, surgeons that have multiple degrees, just like that group of people, which and we're fairly rare, but we're scattered evenly around the planet, um, we have access to our engineering partners, manufacturing partners, prosthesis manufacturing partners. And um, I sat with engineers and designers and said, look, we've got this special 12-year-old boy with a massive overbite, um, but that's not his problem. The the overbite's an expression of the small jaw. Mm -hmm. And um, we we just have to fix it in a novel way. We'll just invent it. And, um, And we did. We just invented it. And it worked. It worked very well. And it just 
grew this child's jaw from the size of a shih tzu up to a, a normal dog. Wow. Um, wow. And, and, uh, and, and the orthodontist got all excited. I said, why are you excited by that? He said, well, I've never seen that before. I said, well, it hasn't been invented before. He said, well, you know, but do you know what you've invented? And I said, I have no idea. What have I invented? And he said, well, you've invented a cure for overbite. I said, uh, well, is this common? He said, it's my entire practice. Wow. I said, what, what do you do? He said, well, I pull back the front teeth. And because the jaw is so small, the teeth are impacted. So we, I ask you to remove the impacted teeth. That's what you get when you're, you're 16 or 17 years of age. Wow. And I said, oh, is that how it works? He said, yeah. He said, didn't you know? I said, well, no. Wow, Paul. <laughs> that's incredible. So, so I invented this thing called IMDO. And so with the engineers and the manufacturers, which are, you know, not territorial to Australia, they're based in Europe, in the US and various other um, continental countries and, and, and places, um, uh, we, we established a, a worldwide um, industry in making these little devices that I invented. And, um, and then I got this steady stream of 12-year-olds with over, overbites. Yeah, I've seen on your website, and the results are incredible. And what's shock, what's even more for me as a mother, uh, and I spoke to you earlier. My son is is um, is a candidate for for surgery. He's yet under so he he doesn't want to get it done. But what's mm. what 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 surprise the, the the difference is um, is incredible, and so quickly too. You were explaining to two weeks from surgery to actually seeing. Um, yeah, yeah. So so it's. It, you know, when you think of a, of a there, are, there are two philosophical ways of looking at an overbite. Mm-hmm. Either you've got big front teeth and you've got too many teeth and we're just going to remove teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's the model that underpins uh, wisdom teeth removal. Mm-hmm. So if you ask, you know, whoever's taking out your wisdom teeth, why, why have I got wisdom teeth? Why are you removing them? Well, first answer would be, well, your orthodontist wants them out. And the second one is, um, well, you don't need them. You know, yeah, that's probably the somehow. most common. That you don't need. Yeah. You, you don't need your you wisdom teeth. Just take them out. Yeah, just, just take them out. They're, they're vestigial. They're, they're evolutionary byproduct of you know a bygone hunter gatherer culture. Um, you know, but but never having lived in the hunter gatherer culture, and and no one ever has, um, and and no one's ever met anyone that lives in a hunter gatherer <laughs> population. <laughs> And they quote evolution uh, as well, and they say, well, evolution has made it redundant. Um, I, I've yet to meet anyone who's met Mr. Evolution. I, I've not had a conversation with him or her personally. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it's a narrative that simply because if everybody says it, it must be true. Mm. Um, but um, but if you really think logically of the premise, and you know, it's a, it's a nonsense. Um, so... If you if you look at body parts as redundant, like your appendix or your uterus or your tonsils or your wisdom teeth oh, or God. your nose or your ears, you know, who are you serving? Are you serving evolution? Because it just seems evolution has created wisdom teeth for the benefit of oral surgeons to remove them. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. yeah, why would evolution do that? You know, it just, <laughs> yeah, no. just doesn't seem logical to me. Um so, um, but but it was exciting um, looking at IMDO. IMDO was the invention, um, and 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 so it was about divorcing yourself from an old caricature or representation or description of why we have impacted wisdom teeth to another one, which is, or maybe just what's common is not that wisdom teeth are impacted, but jaws are small. Mm. And um, and and then when you look at it from that lens, uh, you, you suddenly see all these people with small jaws everywhere, mm. and mm. they've got sort of fat around their neck and look like they don't have mm. a chin, and you know they they've got big eyes, and and if they, if you're, you're really you're describing skinny, my well, six, my sixteen year old there, <laughs> <laughs> but if you're sixteen and you're a female, yeah, and you've got big eyes and you've got a little jaw and a little overbite, it looks remarkably cute, mm. and. And if you think of that word cute, you know, it really is that you're, you're looking at someone who looks much younger than what age they are. Mm, mm. And, um, and so that phenomenon is called neoteny. Neoteny. Uh, neoteny, 
which is where you breed dogs or cats or sheep or cows or whatever to look juvenile. Oh. Even though they're adult animals, they look Young. juvenile. Yeah, yeah. And and breeding, breeding itself is a human invention. Um, it started the agricultural revolution and it started civilization and it started animal husbandry and breeding and it also applied to humans. Mm-hmm. And so we, we breed women to have small jaws and we breed women to have big eyes. And when they're skinny and young, we put them on the cover of Vogue and we say this is the ideal of fe- feminine beauty. And, of course, every model that you see on the cover of Vogue is under the age of 20. Mm. And, um, and, and what you don't see is what happens when they're 40 or 50, mm. lying beside you um, mm. in the marital bed, snoring. <laughs> <coughs> because of their um, small jaw. <laughs> it's their small jaw. So it's this breeding trait. It's, that, it's almost like a, I'm, I, it's, probably wrong to, it's probably wrong to admit this, but I'm almost in one way going, well, you know, you had years of looking amazing while the rest of us wanted to look like you. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> bit of a payback. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, it, so the majority of us marry girls that look like our mums. And um, and if our mums had a small jaw, you know, we epitomised that my ideal partner is going to have a small jaw, or big eyes, and an overbite. And they're exceptionally cute, mm. um, cute. You know that word, cute, mm, mm. and attractive. And um, and and if you if you ask a, a, a heterosexual boy just what is attractive to them, well, he'll always point at the girl with a small jaw. Um, but Isn't if you put a, a a big jaw on a girl you'll say, oh, she's not very attractive. Um, so likewise with boys, if you put a little jaw on a boy, you'll say, oh, he's not attractive. But mm. if you put a big manly jaw on a boy, he looks attractive. So we ultimately identify attractiveness, facial attractiveness, with the size of, you know, size oh, jaw. Wow. And, 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 their size, and their sense of maturity. So the, um, the manly boy uh, is the boy that plays football and has a big jaw and we celebrate that with Roger Ramjet type ca- mm. cartoons and we celebrate the small jaw in girls um, just like with anime and mm. you see Chinese, uh, Japanese rather or Korean uh, anime and they, they draw them with big eyes and little jaws. Mm, and, they do. Um, the, the Betty Boop. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we epitomise it in culture. But unfortunately the gene for the small jaw um, which is promoted through culture um, and through, you know, sexual, you know, attractiveness and so forth, um, is is really not a gene that's carried on a sex chromosome. It's carried on an autosomal chromosome. I, I don't what's ask an, me what gene it is. What, what's an autosomal chromosome? Well, we have um, we have um, well, forty six chromosomes, mm-hmm. and evenly divided, twenty three, twenty three, mm-hmm. and um, one is an X chromosome. Which and, and another is a Y. Mm-hmm. If you're XX, you're a female. If you're XY, you're a male. Mm-hmm. But the gene um, is not on the X or the Y chromosome. It's on the other uh, f- uh, 44 chromosomes. Oh. And they're called the autosomal cr- chromosomes. Okay. And um, you only have to inherit one from your mum and one from your dad, and you've got the condition. It, it seems to be recessive. But it's so common now because effectively we, we're sort of breeding out people with bigger jaws. Um, we, and so if you've, if you've got one abnormal gene, you'll, you'll still have a normal sized jaw, but, um, but you have to have both to really get the, the small lower jaw. Wow. Um, and, and that's just looking at the Mendelian uh, ge- genetics of it. Men- Mendel was the fellow who first described, you know, the pink and the white and the red yes. bee flowers. Um, so th- th- that succinctly describes the entire condition. Wow! But it, it's not actually a jaw that's small. Um, it's the um, if you go back and you really understand the embryology of or the evolutionary, uh, call it phylogenetics of um, how we've become humans from fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that's a whole it, other podcast. It's a whole other <laughs> podcast. Um, it's it's actually the first uh, gill of a fish that's developed the um, the terrestrial uh, and eventually mammalian uh, jaw, and it's um, and it's all due to the evolution of the tongue. 
you know, why why the tongue exists. The, the, the tongue in a fish is not the same as a tongue in a reptile or a mammal. Um, the tongue itself is, uh, is um, it, it, it took well, a couple of hundred million years to evolve um, from fish. Wow. Um, but it is the, um, whatever the gene is, it controls the very volume of the tongue itself. So the tongue, and you can sort of feel it by putting your finger here and then another finger on, on the dome of your tongue inside your mouth. And I'm you can do that. It. You, can, you can feel it. And, and that's your tongue. That's the base of the tongue. Wow. And so often with the small jaw, you see the tongue hanging here, and it looks like it's flesh or skin or whatever or fat around yeah. the neck but it's actually the tongue it's sitting down whilst you're upright but when you're lying on your back it falls backwards uh, and and the tube behind it the airway um collapses like a flat tire hence so why a, people snore that's right so if you've got a a, a, a normal sized jaw that the, the the muscles are, are able to um hold the back of the tongue forward um and keep that airway open so you can breathe through your nose on your back with your mouth closed uh, but with a small jaw, that, that, that tongue collapses so um, and it blocks the airway as the tongue muscles relax in, during deep sleep. And so um, as those tongue muscles relax, that tongue collapses, um, that's when you start to snore and eventually it obstructs so that the tyre is flat. And then, of course, you have no air movement at all and that's the apneic event. That's where you're literally choking and you have to wake up to you know, reacquire tone in your body in order to start breathing. And that sleep, wake, sleep, wake, sleep, wake, which is always happening during sleep, so it's really deep sleep, light sleep, deep sleep, mm, light sleep. Mm. Um, that, that cycling is what they measure in a sleep study, which is called an apnea hypopnea index, and they give you a number and they say, well, you know, you have 30 or 40 events in an hour Oh wow! So that that's um, a that's a legitimate. I've not I've never spoken to anyone that's had the test um, and has right. given me their kind of results. Um, but that that sounds like a lot of time to kind of you know lose your breath while right. sleeping. Yeah. So so as as the as the tire flattens, as you're relaxing the tongue, as you're entering deep sleep, and it occludes, um, it's occluded now, and you stop breathing. And um, and your oxygen levels slowly fall from 100% saturation, 99, 98, 97, and go down to 80%, 75%. Mm. So the body compensates for that by um, producing uh, more hemoglobin mm -hmm. to to carry oxygen. So instead of having, um, I'm going to give you a number here, uh, 127 grams for every 10 litres of blood of hemoglobin, mm -hmm. which is roughly normal, it's what I am, would be what you are. Um, as the saturation of the 127 grams of haemoglobin falls, so measuring it from 100% to 99, 98, the body compensates by producing more haemoglobin to carry more oxygen so as to tolerate that fall in saturation. And that occurs very gradually over many years. So you um, your haemoglobin slowly rises, 127, 128, 129, 130. But it's not so much that it's increasing the amount of haemoglobin in a red blood cell. It's doubling, tripling, or not doubling or tripling, but it's increasing the number of red blood cells. And so as you increase the number of red blood cells in your blood, the blood itself becomes more viscous. Mm. It becomes harder to pump. Mm. And so your heart has to pump harder to drive that column of blood. And so what you find is your blood pressure rises ever so gradually. Mm -hmm. And to resist the blood pressure, your arteries, which are like hoses, they have to thicken their walls in order not to expand and burst from the pressure. So you're wow. starting to get arterial wall thickening. And in arterial wall thickening is the leading cause of stroke and heart attack and kidney disease and so forth. And of course, you know, because you're having a poor night's sleep. All this because um, you're snoring at night? Or yeah, all because you're snoring at night. That, 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 wow. Well, not, not snoring, obstructing. But obstructing, obstructing, not being yeah. able to get the air in. If wow. you're snoring, you're still getting air in. So that's actually not as bad. <laughs> not as yeah, bad. Snoring's yeah, it, not as bad, people. Snoring's a preliminary to obstruction. So if you've got snoring, you know, 
you haven't got obstruction, so you'll you'll have a negative sleep test. Mm. But the snoring itself is a precursor to what's in for you in the future. So if you if you want an indicator for will I develop obstructive sleep apnea, you will say, well, I snore now. Mm. Mm-hmm. What's the chance that as I'm getting worse and worse sleep, that I'm more and more tired during the day, that I have, you know, I'm not running as much, I'm not in the playground as much you know, because I've graduated and I'm watching, you know, football and TV and eating corn chips and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So what you then get is um, uh, an increased weight. Yeah. And, and now you've got a little jaw already and, and now your neck's getting bigger and your, you know, your collar is getting, you know, bigger. Um, so as the donut of your neck is getting bigger, the little hole inside is getting smaller. And so at, the, at some point then you're starting to get obstruction. Mm. And so we say, oh, well, you know, you, if you lose weight, you, you, you'll relieve your obstruction. It doesn't take away the snoring, of course, because you still have a small jaw. But so we say that weight gain and obesity is the cause of obstructive sleep apnea. But that's not the case. What it is is the precipitator or the aggravator or the or the the side effect of sleep apnea, and certainly, you know, that they, they work together in that way. It's all interconnected. What's fascinating, speaking to you, it's all interconnected, isn't it? So if you're getting a poor night's sleep because you've got obstructive sleep apnea, then you're obviously you're tired. So when you're tired, you tend to eat more or laze around more because you're too tired to get up and exercise and do what and 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 what have you. Which hmm. then, with that, follows. Obviously, the what you were saying earlier about the uh, you know the hemoglobin increasing in the blood, and then the you know the the walls thickening of the arteries, and then and then you're still not looking, you're still eating, or you're you're not sleeping well, and what have you. So it kind of it, it kind of has a massive domino effect on everything, doesn't it? It does, and, and it leads to something at the end called death. <laughs> <laughs> And, yeah, and because we all die, and it's an inevitability, um, you, you look at it as well. You know, that's how you do it. And um, but you think, oh, you know, but but do I live the, the same time, the same age? And the answer is no. Um, so if you look at all all form mortality mm. um, or all form morbidity. Um, uh, which is where you just say, well, you've got this condition, regardless of how it's going to kill you, just how long do you live compared to someone who hasn't got it? And it turns mm. out to be roughly 15 years. Mm. Mm. So a 15-year reduction in lifespan simply because you have obstructive sleep apnea. And um, and you say, oh, that's okay, I'll put a CPAP on and try to, like a bicycle pump, it's trying to inflate that flat tyre Mm. Yeah, under high high pr- pressure, and 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 it's got a little dial on the CPAP machine, which is to increase the pressure mm-hmm. of the pump, um, to literally lift that tongue and drive air. Oh, is that what it does? Okay. Yeah. No, I, well, I don't. I, I know people that wear them. I've never actually myself seen or kind of investigated how they work, and, and I, mm. I don't want to. <laughs> but um, so that so it actually takes the pressure off, so that you can get off the tongue. Okay, I thought it was yeah, kind yeah, of it's imbu- literally, it- literally inflating the tire. So you can imagine a tire on on a Land Cruiser and yeah, the weight yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Far out. You have to put a lot of pressure into that tire to lift the tire and lift the Land Cruiser. Right? It's not as much pressure if if it's not a Land Cruiser and it's just a Suzuki Jeep, but but the Suzuki Jeep becomes the Land Cruiser, and so those pressures rise, and so we say, well, it's, it has to do with your weight. Um, but but you know, your you're weight still and your small time. jaw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, that's right. You still got the small jaw. So w- your surgery <clears throat> um, has become revolutionary because you've helped a lot of people by fixing their jaw. Allow right. does that completely get rid of the sleep apnea? It apparently does, yes. Wow. <laughs> but but I, I'll put a cautionary tale to it. Um, if you're going to give someone a, a sleep study and you say you've got an AHI of 40, you've got severe sleep apnea, meaning you've got 40 cycles of, you know, 40, 40 cycles an hour, 
and we're going to give you a CPAP machine and you're going to be on this for the rest of your life. And then you have a repeat sleep study that says, well, you know, the CPAP's working because you've gone down from 40 to 20. Mm -hmm. And now they're treating the score, yeah. And they say there's a positive therapeutic benefit from having your sleep apnea machine. Um, You've gone from a a terrible AHI of 40 down to 20, but 20 is still severe. I was going to say 20 doesn't seem like it's any better than 40. It's a little bit better, but not. You're still, you're still, yeah, you're (laughs) still not breathing properly, or you know, losing your breath 20 times an an hour. Well, that's right. So, so then the argument becomes: Well, you know, you dial up the pressure, you go from forty down to fifteen, or forty down to ten, but it's never zero. Mm. It's never zero. Not only that, you're on the CPAP for the rest of your life, and these people are not surgeons; they're physicians. Mm. They're treating a fundamental medical condition that's mm. going to kill you. Mm. So the question is: Does it take away your all for mortality? Mm. You know, will you live those extra 15 years on a CPAP? Does um, it reverse arterial wall thickening? Does it reverse the rise in hemoglobin or your blood pressure? Well, they, they might say yes, but then you are still taking antihypertensives. Mm. Yeah. And you're forever dieting mm. and you're still not sleeping well because you've got a CPAP on. Wow. Um, you can't go anywhere. You know, you can't get a CPAP into an aircraft. You can't get a CPAP easily into a caravan. You can't get a CPAP easily with you even being awake and erect and fat. Mm. You know, you can't wear a CPAP when you're running. No, you so, so what? So what happened? What is the solution for this? For 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 this? Is it? I mean, obviously, the jaw surgery is one element. But what if they're not a candidate for jaw? They just simply don't want to get it done. So, you know, other than losing weight, is there any other solution? If they're overweight, no, no. no. You, 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 so they're resigned what you, what, to what a life. What you're, what, you're, what you're saying? This is the, the best way I can explain it to you. I get a gun and I shoot you. I put a bullet into you and you've got a bullet hole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the bleeding stops. And I put a band aid over it. But the bullet's still in me. Does the band aid work? And you're saying, is there any other solution apart from removing the bullet that will take away the bullet hole? I go, hmm. Ah. I can just put another band aid on if you'd like. Gotcha. Yeah. Makes sense. That's it. Surgeons are not nasty people. We literally came first in high school. And when we came first in high school, we did medicine. In my class in medicine, each person in that class was the ducks of their school from around the country. Mm -hmm. And in that classroom, the best became surgeons. And then all those surgeons work in the community to service the rest of us. Mm-hmm. They are the smartest people on the planet. They really literally are. Mm-hmm. I and believe that. This debate that surgeons somehow are horrible people that do nasty things to people and remove things, that's the opposite of true. Where I've never met a nasty surgeon, I've met personalities, but all of us, every single one of us, we live for the community. And we're here to make humanity better. And, and every surgeon that you meet, proper surgeons, I'm, mm. I'm not talking about cosmetic surgeons. <laughs> I was going to say. I'm not talking about pediatric surgeons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. talking about people who are not You're medical talking about heart surgeons. surgeons. Yeah, surgeons. Yeah, That's yeah. right. They're, and look, and, and the reality is people. too, I think with surgery, with, sur- with sur- any type of surgery, um, there is obviously a risk factor. You know, and I think that's what we um, also need to be aware of. You know, um, although there are brilliant surgeons, and I've had the pleasure of meeting very many, many brilliant surgeons through you know family having to have um, you know open heart surgery, brain surgery, mm-hmm. and, and whatnot, and they are truly remarkable, incredible individuals um, as as a whole. Um, but things sometimes can, you know may not go as planned, you know, um, or things sometimes do come up. So, that you know, we are human at the end of the day and I think, you know, it's important to kind of um, 
you know, when you are choosing a surgeon or or looking at going and having any type of surgery is to understand that, you know, even though you may have the best surgeon, that there is always that small risk of something oh, perhaps, just, you know. Just seeing a surgeon, you've already got the best surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, 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 I mean, those those people who say I'm the best. That's just that's just such a furphy. Mm. They don't need to say that. They're mm. already the best. If they're mm. saying that. It's just just wrong. Mm. Mm. Um, we we do common procedures that are common to all of us. Um, the older you are, there, there was this interesting study um, done by ophthalmology on LASIK eye surgery. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the risk of LASIK eye surgery, you know, laser eye surgery yeah, to yeah. cornea to take away myopia, um, is blindness, <laughs> or you know, some other complication. And they look at all the complications of laser eye surgery, and it occurs after the machine has been bought, and completely disappear after about five years of practice. Wow! <laughs> so. So the, the the outcome of that study was complications. If you measure them across all procedures, you can measure the rate. Yeah, yeah. But the rate is huge, <laughs> <laughs> almost absolute, um, the earlier in your career that you started. Wow. And the later in your career, the, the, you just don't, don't get it. So the, mm. what you're saying is the older the surgeon, the better the surgeon. The older, the wiser, the grislier. <laughs> The better. <laughs> the better. The, yes. the, the, one, the one that doesn't promote himself, who is a bit angry and a bit cross and, you know, doesn't talk, you know, that, that's the bloke you want to go and see. Yeah. Um, because they, they, all they, they've just dedicated your, their lives to your lives. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's all they've done. Yeah, yeah. They wake up in the morning and all they think about is what they do for a job and yeah. the people that they treat. Yeah. And, yeah. um. Um, you know that that you know, I was a young bloke too, um, and you know I certainly was you know full of myself at some point. Um, <laughs> but that's only because people tell me how great I am. Um, but one of the things of resilience that you learn is to is is not to be resilient against how others accuse you, is to be resilient against your inner voice mm, mm. that tells you that you're great. Mm. You know, and you have to at some point realize that you're not God. You know, yeah. That, that we're here to uh, to learn and continue learning and evolving and adapting. And that's why we don't get complications when we're this age. <laughs> well, that's true. That's <laughs> true. Paul, tell me, um, tell me about some of your success stories and some of the cases that you've that you know that you've helped people with um, with the jaw surgery and obviously breathing better and sleeping better. You know, have you seen things reversed? Have you seen people on the extreme come to you with all the all the um, all all the stuff that you just described, and mm. then have the surgery and then go go to back to great health and you know lose weight yeah. and feel really good? Tell me a little bit about those stories. Oh, they're, they're, the, they're the best story. So I have this steady stream of kids with IMDO, but I also have a steady stream of parents, mums and dads yeah. who genetically have given that gift to their child, not through Unwillingly, any fault of their yeah. own, just yeah. by being Caucasian and white and from Western Europe. Um, so the parents have sleep apnea too. But as kids, they had overbites and they had teeth removed and they had tonsils removed and they had wisdom teeth removed and they've had ENT surgeries galore and they've had cosmetic things. And, and throughout their lives, they've always been a little bit insecure with their small jaw. And, and now they've got a fat neck and they're getting overweight and they're losing energy and losing libido and they're snoring on CPAPs and so forth. And they say, you know, you fix my kid. Can you fix me? Mm-hmm. And I go, yeah, not a problem. And we just take it away. Wow. All of it. So all of a sudden they get their libido. They look good in a mirror. Wow. They yeah. have self-confidence. Yeah. yeah. They can eat. They can chew. And they look back. They go, I wish I had IMTO as a kid. I would have avoided I would have avoided this. all of that, yeah. They lose weight. They throw the CPAP machine away. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, um, that doesn't avoid. It's life changing. It's actually life changing. It's life changing. Yeah. And they get on with their lives. Um, 
you know, they're, they're not ringing me up afterwards and saying, oh, you know, I've got another sleep study that proves I'm on, on zero. They, 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 they literally want to throw, <laughs> throw yeah. the whole life experience behind them. They yeah. don't want to be yeah. reminded of it. Um, the, 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 their only reward is that they, they try to sell their CPAP on eBay. It apparently <laughs> has a zero, zero market. Yeah, um, yeah. No one wants to use a, get a used CPAP machine. No. Um, but I, I, I think... I think at the end of the day, um, you know, e every patient is rewarding, you know, and of itself. You, you do get people who are very narcissistic and and um, and very uh, fragile personalities. Um, um, you know, they they're wanting something from their their look or their face, which you know, however hard you you try to satisfy them, they're never satisfied. They've got personality disorders. Um, but they're extremely rare, those, mm. those people. 99.9% .9 of people are just wonderful. Mm, mm. And um, as a surgeon, um, I, I, I understand that people have a, a certain community view of surgeons, um, that they're rich or they're powerful or they're arrogant or rude or intellectual or I think it's just uh, yeah, it's probably just based yeah. on the on, on the individual's experience with a surgeon. I mean, I, I've I've like I said to you, I've had great experiences with a surgeon. I've had close family members go through major surgery on many occasions, and you know, um, and I've I've spoken to them, and they've you know run through the benefits and the risks and all of that, and they're they're absolutely brilliant people. Equally, I can say I've had a few surgeons that. I'm a bit like mm, I don't, you know, I'm not feeling you right now. You're not, you, you you're yeah, not logical. They're, they're, you don't sound engaging. logical to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it, it's not. It, and if I base my experience on that particular person, then you know. But I feel like a lot of people do come from that angle. They might have a a, um, a, a negative experience with a particular surgeon, or they may feel like they're not being heard. And then then they, they you know, that's like they shut down. It's like I don't want to talk to. You don't talk to me about that particular, you know, surgery. Blah blah blah. My experience mm. has been crap. So I think it's 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 a personal one and a very indi individualistic one as well on on what your experiences have been like. Um, but you know, well, like, well, you, you have to think of the circumstances that you meet a surgeon too. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's yeah. not. A, it's not. You know, you come out of a car accident or you've had an accident skiing, or you've had an accident falling downstairs, but it all, always involves something unanticipated mm. uh, called an accident. Mm. And, um, and the worst kind of interaction is the accident of cancer mm. or pathology mm. or something mortal. Mm. And, and, um, and you're in your most vulnerable place, you know, having I mean, to deal with lawyers, to manage a will and yeah, yeah. Uh, settle your affairs. And, and you're scared you know, too, and, you know, and yeah, all of a sudden... Your your life is in, literally in someone else's hands, you know, yeah. and that 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 as a human, you know, you don't know, you don't know. You think, oh, cool, cool, it could all go really well, or it could all, you know, not go well, or what do I do? And so it's it's an interesting time, and I think we do, in a normal healthy state of mind, um, if you were, for example, going to see a surgeon to, you know, for facial reconstruction or, or, or you know, you want a, you know, a uh, plastic surgery that's not, you know, um, you haven't been in an accident or, you know, in a trauma or you haven't had open heart surgery because, you you know, your, your heart's blocked. You're going simply for looks. It's a very different experience, I think, anyway. But, well, um, it is. So, it, you know, the, 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 the self-promoting cosmetic surgeon and thank God the regulations are, you know, trying to... Thank God. Um, yeah, yeah. You know that, that that title of surgeon uh, for a long time was anyone could call themselves a surgeon, uh, a tree surgeon, <laughs> a it's, car it's surgeon. It's still, I, I still, surgeon. yeah, I still feel even now it's kind of, um, you know, kind of fizzling into the um, into the beauty realm where eighteen mm. year olds are doing this one it's year important. nursing course mm. and they're injecting toxins into women's faces. Mm. And I'm like, how is that not? How is that allowed? But that's, no, again, that's another, another podcast. <laughs> that's a whole different podcast. Well, a, a large number of people that come to me are coming purely for the cosmetic effects of orthognathic surgery. And um, I, I, I say, I can't treat you. And that's it. Mm. And they get very upset. Mm. And so they, they'll fabricate medical reasons to validate their orthognathic surgery. And unless I can independently 
validate and justify to myself my own inner voice mm. uh, that this has a functional outcome to it. I you know, just have to simply refuse to treat them. And of course, you know, you're dealing with a personality that is already a bit odd or vulnerable and, and they start arguing. Yeah, yeah. And you think, uh, and, and the, uh, you know, the, the um, medium of social media and um, Facebook and Instagram yeah. and anonymous Google reviews, you know, you're, you're, you're vulnerable to that. But you have you to are. keep true to the fact that you don't really want to, you know, publicise them or defend yourself and therefore, you know, reveal who this argumentative person is. Um, it's it's become a difficult practice um, across the board for everybody because we are dealing with people who are fundamentally got something wrong, mm. you know, physically, and we all only want to treat, real surgeons only treat pathologies, mm, mm, you know, definable mm. thing. Mm. Aesthetics is not a definable thing. No. You know, no. It's, it's very intrinsic. It's very personal. Um and it's it's um, it's characterised by the environment that you live in. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're if you're a gay man and you're very promiscuous and you go to gay bars and you're just picking up multiple uh, sexual partners, um, which is based on aesthetic attractiveness, um, and you're wanting surgery to improve that, mm. um, you, you think I, I can't treat you. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's yeah. not a commentary about your yeah. lifestyle. It's it's a commentary of your personality. Yeah, yeah. And um and so um, and and likewise, young girls, um and young heterosexual men mm. who literally feel that they you know that they they're not socially empowered, they're not attractive. Um, um, I, can can I deny surgery to them based on that? And and I look at that in a slightly different way. They they they're, they're you know the the ugly person who who says, "I know that this is not my face. I know that fundamentally, functionally, constructively, it's not working." And there's and there are inner functional aspects. My airway is affected. I'm snoring. I'm not sleeping well. Blah blah blah. Mm. Well, yeah, the deliberate effort of surgery is to make them themselves. Yeah. Perfectly yeah. proportioned, perfectly symmetrical. And by doing that, obviously managing the aesthetic, um, that is still therapeutic. Yeah. You know, yeah. That that yeah. is therapeutic because yeah. it's it's affecting the very psychology of the person in terms of their self esteem and in terms of managing how other strangers look at them. Mm. You know, mm. if they get a job or, you know, how well the teacher you know, respects them in the classroom. Yeah. You know, that sleepy kid in the back of the class who's not paying attention to the teacher who's got a little bit of animus, you know, towards, um, you know, all these other kids are listening to me. I I hate that kid. He just doesn't listen. He doesn't answer. He doesn't do do his homework. Um, That teacher is more than likely to, to approach the parents and say, I think your child has attention deficit disorder. Oh my God, you've just described my my sixteen year old. And you need to go and see a psychologist or a psychiatrist or your GP and get on Ritalin to wake them up so that they could be more attentive to me in my classroom. You think, oh, okay. So they go on Ritalin for the rest of their life. They've got a diagnosis of ADHD for the rest of their life. And all they need is a little sleep. And you know. all they're doing is just not sleeping well. And then, yeah. And, of course, the teacher doesn't relate to them because they look odd because they've got a little jaw and a big overbite and, oh, you've got to get braces. Yeah, yeah. Got a big nose. You know, the kids are teasing them because, you know, they've got a big honker on on their face. But really, that, they don't. they just got a small jaw that magnifies the normal bits. That's and, incredible. Um, what you've just described, literally and honestly, and I'm I, I openly sharing this. And I'm not the only parent. There's so many parents that are that you know have children that are possibly um, do have sleep apnea because their their small jaw and aren't getting good quality sleep, and it is reflecting in their schoolwork, in their behaviour, in mm-hmm. everything else. It is, um, yeah, and just just broad broad effects. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the weird thing is you've got the one condition 
Mm. It's just one. Mm. I don't know if you watch uh, Gre- Gregory House. House. I used to watch it. Yeah, yeah. I used to love House. And um, you know, he, sits he was a bit grumpy, but brilliant. Says, these, <laughs> these are all the symptoms. You know? Yeah. And, and what's the diagnosis? And they'll, they'll propose the diagnosis, and they go, "Well, it, it isn't that because this symptom doesn't fit that diagnosis." And yeah. you've got this symptom. And they go, well, why can't they have two diagnoses? And how said it best? He said, he said, um, if you have a diagnosis, that's like winning lotto. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a lottery. Wow. It's, these, each condition is extremely rare. Wow. And now you're saying you've got two rare conditions. You may well as may as well have played lottery top twice and won twice. The chances of that are phenomenally small. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, the, the entire purpose of the lottery is not to make us wealthier. So it's a hidden tax to, to make the state richer. But at the end of the day, <laughs> at the I'm end of the day. I'm coming to Sydney soon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to your, to your, to your practice uh, with my son <laughs> and then I'm going to take you out for a cafe and you're, we're going to share more of this stuff. It's, you're, fasc- <laughs> you're a fascinating man, seriously. <laughs> You have to buy my book. I am going to buy it because you've written a whole book wrote, on this, a whole book a whole on this book for, for, for disconcerting parents like myself and yeah. anyone for that matter that That's is right. um, that is struggling with sleep. And, I, and I mean, we, this podcast started about women, but I think we've covered so many topics. And, uh, you know, suffice to say, you know, if you don't get enough sleep um, or you're having a, um, a, you know, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, then it does affect other elements of your health, including hormones and... And, you know, heart health and well, blood absolutely. pressure and all absolutely. those things. Um, yeah, so but- with women, you know, if you don't sleep properly, you know, is it any surprise that those hormones that are only secreted, only secreted in deep sleep, mm, mm. Yeah, is it any surprise those hormones aren't really there doing their job? Well, they're not because, I mean, the most important factor of sleep, as I understand it, again, like a layman, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is it's the time that the body needs to rest and recover and rejuvenate mm-hmm. itself. Am I right? All your cells, it goes into it goes into detoxification, everything that it needs mm-hmm. to get rid of, it gets rid of and renews and, and, and what have you. And most importantly, it allows your brain to just kind of be still and relax. And all those all that stuff that's going on in your body whilst you sleep, if you don't give it that time, mm. um, then it doesn't have the opportunity to repair. And there well, was... It, it, you're right. It, and it happens once a day. It so happens once a day. It, it, that's it right. can't happen once a week. Yeah. You know, or, yeah. or a month. Yeah. Or maybe after a CPAP. Mm. You mm. know, this issue that I was reflecting on, which is the multiple diagnosis problem. Mm. You know, how can how can a child, a healthy child that survived childbirth, how can that child all of a sudden starting school have ADHD, allergies, big tonsils, snoring, sleep apnea, mm. isn't performing well in a class of his peers mm. where they're supposed to be all equal? So is he unintelligent, mm. unmotivated? Poor sleep patterns, mm. psychological disturbance, you know, and then you've got the dental, orthodontic issues, impacted wisdom teeth, crowded teeth. You know, you, you've got fifty thousand diagnoses. Wow. It seems to be it seems to be that every individual that you go and ask an opinion from puts you in their box. Yeah, and now you've got another diagnosis. Well, this is the thing. Oh, you, you've got behavioural issues now because you can't sit still in class, and you're constantly moving around, and you're not listening, mm. or you're you're zoning out, right? Mm. And then you've got braces because you know your teeth are crooked, and you know, yeah. and that's gonna. Oh, and now we'll do this. You know, um, yeah, it's 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 a huge eye opener talking it's to you today. It's a huge eye opener, right? It's a huge so, eye opener. So, so if we go back to Gregory House mm. and we say, well, you know. Let's not call them diseases. These are symptoms or mm. signs of what we're seeing as doctors. And let's be smart about it because we came first in school. We came mm. first in university. We came first, first, first. Mm. You know, why is it that this person has all these problems? It's you can't think of life in terms of winning the lottery 10 times in a row. Mm. It's not even once. It's mm. not twice. It's 10 times. Mm. So, Look at the bigger picture. That's what doctors do. 
Mm. They look at you from your tips of your toes to the tip of your head. Mm. And they put it all together. Yeah. And the older and wiser you are, literally, it's not an idiom. Mm. It's real. It's matched. The older you are, the wiser you are. Mm. And the smarter you are is reflecting the fact that whoever you're seeing is a surgeon. Mm. They're there to put it all together. Mm. Yeah. And then they're looking for the common cause. They take that away, the first domino. Mm. Yeah. And That's it, taking that first domino away. That's and... right. And really, you know, and I've spoken about it, it's just genetic. It's this little breeding trait, you know, why, you know, the, the, the perfect human on the planet was what came out of Ethiopia. Yeah. Really? All the way back 300,000 years ago and, you know, migrated around 60, 80,000 years out of Africa and went to the rest of the planet. The original human out of Ethiopia, um, which doesn't exist now in Ethiopia, but it exists in Australia, the perfect human is the Australian Aboriginal, who, who we, we were well, before we settled in Asia or India or the rest of Africa and Western Europe and became the various breeds of human. Mm, mm. You know, we're not races, we're breeds. We're Shih Tzus and Poodles and Great <laughs> Danes. Yeah. Yeah, and well, just like a vet, uh, I went to uh, uh, one of my patients as a vet, got many vets as patients, and uh, I spoke to her yesterday. I said, well, I'm thinking of buying a West Highland White. What mm -hmm. do you think of that breed of dog? Oh, get, get veterinary insurance because the first year of their existence is miserable. Oh, really? <laughs> And I go, okay. I'm not going to get She the... knows. She's yeah. a vet. She yeah. understands that that breed has these diseases. Yeah, yeah. You know? And yeah. I know the diseases that afflict Westerns, Westerners, and one of them is sleep apnea. And yeah. it's the rise and rise of sleep apnea is as much motivated by Philips and ResMed and you know, all the various companies that promote selling CPAP machines. Mm, mm. Yeah, as it is by social media or whatever. Mm. Is it real medicine? You know, selling band aids. It sounds like yeah. it's selling band aids. It's not really getting to the core root. It's not getting to the cause. Mm. Yeah, and um, and you know, if you if you're promoting a cure for sleep apnea, that's like saying I've got a vaccine for polio. Mm. You know, all of a sudden, no one needs an iron lung anymore. Mm. Mm. And the factory that produces iron lungs goes broke. Mm. So the factory that produces iron lungs doesn't want to have a bar of polio vaccine. No. Yeah. No. But we all, as a community, want polio vaccine. And so a cure for sleep apnea is what should be driving medicine. Mm. Mm. It's the biggest disease on the planet, whether you're a male or a female. The incidence is the same. Mm. The incidence is the same with wisdom teeth. The incidence is the same with snoring. So the incidence is the same with tonsillectomies. Yeah, that's crazy. And because they're all an ADHD. Look at the incidence of that. That's yeah. That's on the rise. The that's incidence the... of poor sleep generally. Yeah, yeah. Know? And we all want to blame everything else according to the box of the person whose opinion you, you're drawing from. Mm. Yeah. So. Look at it globally, look at it as a fundamental totality and just see for what it is. Mm. And if you've got a cure for it, great, well done. That's the cure, that's for the adult mum and dad, but then there's a prevention. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, the thing that prevents you having to lose your wisdom teeth, the thing that prevents you having to need all those years of braces just to pull back your big front teeth mm. backwards. Mm, yeah. you know, to reduce that overbite. Um, you know, the thing that prevents you having to have your tonsils removed, prevents you having to take your Ritalin, prevents your inattention, prevents the social negativity of the look of having a small jaw on a boy. Mm, yeah. You know, um, a normal-sized jaw on a girl looks fantastic. Mm, mm. And you think of Angelina Jolie. Mm. And it prevents all the cosmetic surgery silliness with fillers and so forth to camouflage another band-aid 
Yeah, well, they can. There's there's jaw fillers now. I think where they oh, can, yeah. I, I, yeah. and it's like, what, what the hell is that now? All those rules Which on kind cosmetics, of freaks me out a little bit. Promoting cosmetic treatments and yeah. so forth. I, I just got one on Facebook. You know, we've got five clinics in Five Doc and Tugra and Sydney, and I think not one name, not one doctor on it. They're promoting you know, invasive treatments, they are invasive mm. fillers. You know, they promote as, oh, they resorb after two years. I've never seen a filler resorb after two years. No, but apparently I was talking to a friend of mine that's a, a cosmetic nurse um, and she's um, she was saying that now the plastic surgeon community are saying no fillers because apparently it leaves a lot of scarring and it's oh, a lot it's, harder it's to to do a, a facelift if you want a facelift yeah. afterwards. So there's all these complications that have Horrible come out of fillers. From, from fillers. You know, I think that Horrible. I think people but you know you know those those, those cosmetic rules mm. only apply to doctors. Oh wow. They don't apply to nurses. They don't apply to dentists. Nurses and dentists also put in fillers. Mm, they do. Yeah. They do. They only apply to medical doctors. Yeah. There's a clinic here in Melbourne. You can get your teeth done and, and get Botox all in the one day. Yeah. And I just sit there, I'm like, is what, who's I, doing what? I, I get it. I get it. You know, the, the laws are just, you know, they, they, they're just written by, uh, I don't know, people who didn't graduate from high school. Yeah, it's they, scary. They, it, it, is, it is terrible. And the only people that suffer are the people, you know, real people in the community, young 18-year-old girls who are getting these things done, they're irreversible. Mm. You know the rise and rise of tattoos, and they go, "Oh yeah, but but you know you can, you can um, you can get rid of tattoos." Mm. No, you can't. No, you can't. Because the people who get rid of tattoos, they have to go through years of treatment, and there's always the residua. But forgetting that, you don't even know what you're putting in your body. Mm. You don't know what chemicals there are in those stains and pigments that they inject. No. No. You know, and they try to regulate and say, oh, you know, you've got to put that thing in the steriliser. The only reason why they put that regulation there is because they weren't using a steriliser. Oh, my God. Oh, I just don't want to even think yeah. about it. <laughs> so so how, many, how many things out there really are just so dangerous and horrible? And so when you get a chiropractor telling you, I can fix this scoliosis of your spine, you don't need to see an invasive surgeon who's going to do a horrible operation and leave you paralysed. Who's, what chiropractor would, you know, mm. who, who, would, who yeah. would accept that advice, accept a chiropractor? Yeah. I guess sometimes you know, and too. And it's so self-serving. It is. It really is. Look, I think, so, yeah, I think some, yeah, horses for courses at the end of the day, you, you know, it's really hard. It's really hard to kind of, um, I think also people out of desperation and fear sometimes will resort to perhaps seeing, you know, physicians that are not highly experienced because, you know, they've, they've you know, they've, they want, they've tried everything, but they don't want to get the surgery and they're thinking, oh, maybe I'll, I'll try this guy because I've heard a lot of people go to him and he's really good or he or she. Um, and then and it happened to me with my spine. You know, I went to a supposedly, and not, not to say there's some brilliant chiropractors out there, okay, I'm not, this is not a ditch at any chiropractor because there's a lot of great chiropractors out there, but I had an, an, a bit of an issue with my back at a very young age and I foolishly went to see a chiropractor that promised he was going to fix it and um, ultimately made it a lot worse. Um, and I just had my first son, so I was very young at the time and, um, and, and was not willing to go under the knife because I knew the recovery was going to be long and my son was a toddler, not even a toddler, and I just didn't have the support to have the surgery. Long story short. Well, it, it, it's, I, I think it's important that all these paraprofessional groups outside of medicine are still engaged, mm, mm. but they shouldn't be leading. No, no, no. You know, they should that, be, that, it should be, inter, they should be working integrally, inter, integrate, I can't speak. <laughs> they should be working integrant. Why can't I say that word? If I try to say it, I'm going to bumble it as well. They should work integratively with doctors and surgeons, you know, as a recovery. I have a brilliant yeah, physio. But, but who's the primary, who, who should be the primary leader? You know, is it the sailor or is it the admiral? 
the admiral. 100%. It has to be the Admiral. 100%. And the sailor that says to you, oh, you don't want to talk to the Admiral, he's a bastard, you know, he mm, doesn't know how mm, to drive mm. this ship. Mm. You've got to look at him and say, um, you're a sailor. Mm, mm, you mm. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a, it's been a, an absolute pleasure meeting you, chatting with you and learning so much. I feel like I've been in a lecture, in a good lecture. Um, and, you know, you've been so gracious sharing your um, insights and so transparative as well. So thank you so much. And we'll have your the link to your book for any parents wanting to read the book on our website um, so they can get their head around the uh, IMDO surgery for kids or for mm. their children. Um, and um, But, yes, take on board Dr. Paul's advice and um, find out who your surgeon is, ask all the right questions, and most importantly, um, the older, the wiser, and the grumpier he is, <laughs> the better he is. No. Well, you know, it, mums are the smartest women in the world we are. regarding their own children. <laughs> We you are. Know, we, 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 you, you totally are. You right? know, you, you, we, you we feel it. You into their care. You look after them. Um, and for the, the, you know, for the cost of a book, which is less, far less than the cost of visiting a doctor. Mm. Um, and, and most parents or most adults will say, I'm not smart enough. You just tell me what to do. Um, but I've never had a mother say that to me. Mm. You know, all, all the mothers that I meet, they go, no, I'm going to buy that book. Mm. And I'm get, uh, and I I am if I'm not smart enough, I'm going to become smart enough for my child. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And they do. Thank you once again. All right. All right. Um, Lovely to speak to you. Thank you so much. Oh my God, pleasure. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode with Dr. Paul Konsiensich. For more information, jump on caspermagazine.com where you'll find a link to his book and his website. Um, if you love this episode, make sure to subscribe and like so that you get notified for when we have a brand new episode coming out. And let me tell you, there's some awesome episodes with some incredible guests coming very, very soon. 